The people in the front row here, who are usually for their performances dressed all in black, like undertakers, are for this program, because it is more upbeat and strong, are multicolored. So uh, we are reading aloud from the Iowa City Senior Center. We have read at the library many times. It's always a privilege and a pleasure to do so, no matter what the size of the audience. Uh, it's, a, it's a lovely place to read. So April is National Poetry Month, and a big part of our program consists of poems by Latino poets. Um, so we're celebrating poetry. But there's a bonus in this program. Uh, there are reminiscences uh, by Rose Curry, who's not going to stand up probably, but you'll see her in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> reminiscences of growing up as a Chicana, a Mexican-American in Chicago. And also some reminiscences by Jim Curry, who is the creator and director of this program, as the gringo who married her. <laughs> so we're celebrating poetry in this program, but as it turns out, we're also <coughs> celebrating immigration uh, and recognizing um, what, what immigrants contribute to this country. And um, it seems a particularly pertinent thing to be focusing on at the present time, as I sh I'm sure you all recognize. Um, I'll introduce the members of the uh, of Reading Aloud. Johnny Ellsworth, okay, Pat Huff, Kathy Mitchell, Carrie Malone, Chuck Felling, Michael Chan, Nancy Lynch, and the guy at the end is Russ Curry, who's our technical assistant. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, I'm going to ask you to please hold your applause until the end of the program, and now let Jim take over. I'll read this in my broken Spanish. The English is on the screen. Bienvenido a nuestra presentación. Hoy estamos celebrando la vida y el espíritu de la gente latina. Lo haremos a través de los relatos biográficos y lecturas de poetas españoles. El primer relato será leído por Rosa Curry, una chicana que vivía en el barrio de la calle 18 en Chicago. Entonces voy a leer un relato sobre la vida de su padre, un inmigrante de México. Los poemas serán leídos por los miembros de Reading Aloud del Senior Center of Iowa City. Hay un tema de la disposición de los poemas. Uno de los primeros poemas por Pablo Neruda describe la opresión de los incas del Perú. Entonces, tratando de la migra, los problemas de las mujeres, orgullo étnico y esperanza para el futuro. To Walt Whitman by Angela de Ayos. Hey man, my brother, world poet, prophet, demograph democratic, here's a guitar for you, a Chicana guitar, so you can spill out a song for the open road, big enough for my people, my Native Amerindian race that I can't seem to find in your poems. Anguish of Death by Pablo Neruda, translated by James Wright. In Cajamarca, the anguish of death began. The youthful Arawapa, sky blue stamen, illustrious tree, listened to the wind carry the faint murmur of steel. There was a confused light 
an earth tremor from the coast, an unbelievable galloping, rearing in power from iron and iron among the weeds. The governors were arriving. The Inca came out to the music, surrounded by his nobles. The visitors from another planet, sweaty and bearded, go to do reverence. The chaplain, Valverde, treacherous heart, rotten jackal, brings forward a strange object, a piece of a basket, a fruit, perhaps from the same planet from which the horses come. Atahualpa takes it. He does not know what it is made of. It doesn't shine. It makes no noise. And he lets it fall, smiling. Death, vengeance, kill, I will absolve you. The jackal of the murderous cross cries out. Thunder draws near the robbers. Our blood is shed in its cradle. The young princes gather like a chorus around the Inca in the hour of the anguish of death. 10,000 Peruvians fell under crosses and swords. The blood moistened the robes of Atahualpa, Pizarro, the cruel hog from Western Spain, had the slender arms of the Inca tied up. Night has now come down over Peru like a live coal that is black. The United Fruit Company by Pablo Neruda. When the trumpet sounded, everything was prepared on earth, and Jehovah gave the world to Coca-Cola Inc., Anaconda, Ford, Motor Co Ford Motors, and other corporations. The United Fruit Company reserved for itself the most juicy piece, the central coast of my world, the delicate waste of America. It rebaptized these countries, banana republics, and over the sleeping dead, over the unquiet heroes who won greatness, liberty, and banners, it established an opera buffa. It abolished free will, gave out imperial crowns, encouraged envy, attracted the dictatorship of flies, Trujillo flies, Tachos flies, Carreas flies, Martinez flies, Ubico flies, flies sticky with submissive blood and marmalade, drunken flies that buzz over the tombs of the people, circus flies, wise flies, expert at tyranny. With the bloodthirsty flies came the fruit company, amassed coffee and fruit in ships which put to sea like overloaded trays with the treasures from our sunken lands. Meanwhile, the Indians fall into the sugared depths of the harbors and are buried in the morning mists. A corpse rolls, a thing without name, a discarded number, a bunch of rotten fruit thrown on the garbage heap. Bilingual by Rina Espaillat. My father liked them separate, one there and one here, ayi iaki, as if aware that words might cut in two his daughter's heart, el corazón, and lock the alien part to what he was, his memory, his name, su nombre, with a key he could not claim. English outside this door, Spanish inside, he said, y basta. But who can divide the world, the word, mundo y palabra, from any child? I knew how to be dumb and stubborn, testaruda. Late in bed, I hoarded over secret syllables I read until my tongue, mi lengua, learned to run where his stumbled, and still the heart was one. I like to think he knew that, even when proud, orgulloso, 
and still the heart was one. I let, oh, I'm sorry. I like to think he knew that. Even when proud, orgulloso of his daughter's pen, he stood outside mis versos, half in fear of words he loved but wanted not to hear. Chicana did not mean the same thing to me as it did to my father. Americans thought of the word to be described as, and I quote, persons who were poor, uneducated, unskilled, ignorant, and backwards. My father found the word offensive, for he was a hardworking man and a proud man. I was one of seven children born to Angelo Flores and Genoveva Gonzalez. My father was born in Almeca, Mexico, and my mother was born in Aurora. Illinois. My father came along with many other Mexicans to work on the railroad near Galesburg, Illinois. We, along with other family members, lived in boxcars. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know how many people know about the life of boxcar people, but it was rough. Life could be difficult for people who worked hard and to get ahead. My family had to leave the boxcars because my father was not well and could not do the work anymore. We later found out that he was going blind, but my father later got a job working for a furniture company and he worked there for over 30 years. In my later years, my mother would talk about how she and my older sis her older sister would go up in the hill in the camp and fetch water to use in the boxcars, which had no running water at all. She talked about how she had to go up with her sister and have so much fun coming down the hill, fetching water, falling and getting all wet then having to go back up and get more water. It is hard to believe in this mix that there was still laughter. My parents were unable to care for us as we were for kids. We were very young and we were taken away from them. We spent our childhood in a Catholic orphanage. We were raised by nuns from Canada who were very strict. My father told me that I was, when I was there, I would cry because I wanted my beans and tortillas. I left the orphanage after eighth grade. I went to live with my mother who lived on 18th Street near the south side of Chicago. I went to a Catholic school for a year, but the nuns would not pass me because I could not pay. I had to redo my ninth year again at Harrison High School, but I quit that because I was afraid of the gangs. In my later years, I got my GED while working and taking care of my family, my husband Jim, my son Russell, and my daughter Cassie. I remember when everybody would get together at my grandparents' or aunt's house in the Christmas Eve to make tamales, beans, salsa, and fresh tortillas. All the windows would be dripping with steam as we women were cooking our hearts out, and as always, the men in the living room fortifying themselves with tequila. Our loves, <clears throat> our families all lived very close to each other, and it was nice to have my children near their grandmother and always having Mexican food cooking in her, chicken, in her kitchen. This is why 18th Street was important to us. It's a place where our families lived, including many aunts, uncles, cousin. It's a place where we went to church, did our shopping. It's a place where many of us had jobs, including my first job as a dishwasher. For sure, 18th Street had its dark side with the gangs, drugs, and crime. But it was mainly a place where we as Mexicans shared our history and our identity. I learned through all the years of uncertainty, I had choices. I had to choose if I was going to let my life be miserable. I had to choose if I was gonna go let people drag me down because I was Mexican. I had to choose if I was going to take my parents, make my parents proud of me like I was proud of them, or if I was going to face my life with my head held high and I chose the latter. But one thing I have not said was how we were treated because we were Mexicans. We were ignored for things like going to stores not in our neighborhood to buy things. We were, we were patiently waiting for clerks to wait on and watching them always serve other people. On how, or how we were looked at when we entered certain restaurants not in the neighborhood, even being treated differently in the orphanage. I was no longer able to speak Spanish and having my name changed from Maria del Rosario Flores to Rosemary Flores. Was I upset about this? Yes, I was, but I was not going to let this define my life. To me, hate looked ugly. 
Although I wouldn't, did not participate in the Chicano struggles, struggles, I was aware of them. Life to me was centered on my family. But I would like to say to finish up by saying is, Chicanos are far away from being persons who are poor, unskilled, uneducated, ignorant, or backwards. We are proud people who cared for our families and our way of life. We are doctors, nurses, politicians, teachers, farmers, educators, caregivers, and more. I am proud to be a Mexican, Chicano, or whatever people wanted to label us as, but I don't worry about labels. All I worried about was that I did the best that I could to raise my family, to love and be loved, and proud of what I am, a Chicana. Thank you. La Migra by Pat Mora. Let's play La Migra. I will be the border patrol. You will be the Mexican maid. I get the badge and sunglasses. You can hide and run, but you can't get away because I have a jeep. I can take you wherever I want, but don't ask questions because I don't speak Spanish. I can touch you wherever I want, but don't complain too much because I've got boots and kick if I have to, and I have handcuffs, oh, and a gun. Get ready, get set, run. Let's play La Migra. You be the border patrol, I'll be the Mexican woman. Your Jeep has a flat. You have been spotted by the sun. All you have is heavy, hat, glasses, badge, shoes, gun. I know this desert, where to rest, where to drink. Oh, I'm not alone. Oh, you hear the singing? You hear us singing and laughing in the wind? Agua dolce brota, aquí, aquí, aquí. But since you can't speak Spanish, you do not understand. Get ready. <laughs> Nativity for two Salvadorian women, 1968 to 87 by Demetria Martinez. Your eyes large as Canada welcome this stranger. We meet in a Juarez train station where you sat for hours, your Austrian blooming in you like cactus fruit. Dresses stained where breasts leak, panties and purses tagged, Heco and El Salvador. Your belts like equators mark north from south, borders I cannot cross. Let's see, where do, where do we change here? Mm -hmm. Is this, we change, we read the Okay. Page. For I am an American reporter, pen and notebook, the tools of my tribe distance us, though in any other era I might press a, a stethoscope to your wounds Hear the symphony of the unborn, finger forth infants to light, wipe afterbirth, cut cords. It is impossible to raise a child in that country. Sisters, I am no saint, just a woman who happens to be a reporter, a reporter who happens to be a woman, squat in forest, peeing on pine needles, watching you vomit morning sickness, a sickness infinite as a war in El Salvador, a sickness my pen and notebook will not ease. Ease, Tell me, por qué están aquí? When, how did you cross over? In my country, we sing of a baby in a manger. 
Finance death squads, how to write of this shame, of the children you chose to save. It is impossible to raise a child in that country. A North American reporter, I smiled. You tell me you are due in December. We nod, knowing what women know. I shut my notebook, watch your car rock through the gila, a canoe hanging over the windshield like the beak of an eagle. Babies turning in your wombs, summoned to Belen to be born. Glow Flesh by Victor Hernandez Cruz. You are falling, sunshine miracle. Your lips are wet, rain to our hearts, flood in every opening. On the stoop, your skirts rises, fingers goes up your legs. You are falling in the streets, the hallways of East Harlem, the dark hallways of East Harlem, the dark hallways with mattresses of East Harlem, you are falling. Roll with us the avenues, you are falling. The night queen of the earth, you are falling on us with lips and thighs and big round breasts. We hold in our hands and hear your womb and hear your poor mom take your blood get hot. Come out, crack your eggs on stupid American heads. Queen of the earth, push us to the walls. Fall on us, kill us with your love and tongue. Harlem queen, fine mama, sprinkle us with it. There are no bargains, pure product. You are falling, bloom, bloom. You got all sing, dark and you shine, grown fat for love. In the dark, you are like a volcano with a sea of heat. Explode, you are falling, explode. Loose Woman by Sandra Cisneros. They say I'm a beast and feast on it, when all along I thought that's what a woman was. They say I'm a bitch or witch. I've claimed the same and never winced. They say I'm a matcha, hell on wheels, viva la vulva, fire and brimstone, man-hating, devastating, Boogie woman lesbian, not necessarily, but I like the compliment. The mob arrives with stones and sticks to maim and lame and do me in. All the same, when I open my mouth, they wobble like gin. Diamonds and pearls tumble from my tongue, or toads and serpents, depending on the mood I'm in. I like the itch I provoke, the rustle of rumor like crinoline. I am the woman of myth and bullshit. True, I authored some of it. I built my little house of ill repute, brick by brick, labored, loved, and masoned it. I live like so, heart as sail, ballast, rudder, bow, rowdy, indulgent to excess, my sin and success, I think of me to gluttony. By all accounts, I am a danger to society. I'm Pancha Vila. I break laws, upset the natural order, anguish the Pope, and make fathers cry. I am beyond the jaw of law. I'm the desperata, most 
wanted public enemy, my happy picture grinning from the wall. I strike terror among men. I can't be bothered what they think, Kecho Vyanya a la Ching Chang Chong. For this, the cross, the Calvary. In other words, I'm anarchy. I'm an aim well, shoot sharp, sharp tongue, sharp thinking, fast speaking, foot loose, loose tongue, let loose, woman on the loose, loose woman. Beware, honey. I'm bitch, beast, matcha, watchily. Ping, ping, ping. I break things. <laughs> Blood Gang Call by Juan Felipe Herrera. <clears throat> Calling all tomato pickers, the ones wearing death frowns instead of jackets. Calling all orange and lemon carriers, come down the ladder to this hole. Calling all chili pepper sack humpers, you, yes, you the ones with a crucifix, calling all garlic twisters caught in the winter spell of frozen sputum, calling all apple tossers high up in the heaven of pesticides, stick-faced, calling all onion priests and onion nuns and onion saints killing for rain, calling all tobacco pullers thick, thick leaf rollers in the ice burn of North Carolina, calling all melon pitchers in the river machine in the assembly of bones, calling all artichoke pressers kneeling at the mount of signs chanting om, calling all peach slicers preserving shells in the form of a tiny orange fetus, Call all <clears throat> calling all lettuce skirts kicking lust down to the underworld soul prison, calling all watermelon shiners, parrying the sugary womb in search of goddess, calling all cotton pilots, seeding the froth on my mother's grave, rebellious, calling all strawberry weavers, threading your wire mesh heart with thorns, calling all tomato pickers, the old ones, wearing frayed radiator masks. <clears throat> Toward a portrait of the undocumented by Javier O. Huerta. The economy is a puppeteer manipulating my feet. Who's in control when you dance? Pregnant with illegals, the Camaro labors up the road. Soon, I will be born. I am the heat captured by infrared eyes. Had you no life before this? Are you not the source of that warmth? I am a night shadow. When La Migra shines spotlights, I disperse. A body snatcher, I steal faces and walk among the people unnoticed. I wear anonymity like an oversized trench coat. Now and then, I flash. Is your name perverse? Is your skin not your own? Are you not flesh? Read me. I am a document without an official seal. Who authored you? War Came, War Went by Joseph Delgado. War came, war went. 
like grandmother's cigarette smoke through the screen door, where she whittles bone and wood, praying for rain, praying for the snakes to stop hissing her name from the bunch grass or under the old Chevy that never got fixed. She whispers names long since forgotten milagros. Dios Santo Nino San Isidro. She twists her tongue in psalms and bends her back over the wash, sheets sweat stained, a drop of blood like a peach from the branch hangs from the cloth, the smell of camphor and gauze, that taste of piss in the air, pulling grit and sand from teeth watching the wind waver through and over grass, watch as the sunlight traces my grandmother's face, watch as she eyes the ghosts sitting down by the acacia. She tells me, don't go, mio, don't go. Un caballero verdadero, Angelo Flores. Caballero is Spanish for gentleman, a man of honor. The roots of the word can be traced back a thousand years to the Christian Crusades when the code of chivalry was born. Angelo Flores, in English, my father-in-law was one of the most remarkable men I have ever known. A man of courage, generosity, and kindness a true man of honor. I met Maria del Rosario Flores, known as Rose to her friends and family, on a blind date in the early 60s. At the time, she was living just south of Chicago's 18th Street in the Mexican barrio with her, brother, with her father and sisters. In the beginning, Angelo disapproved of my courting his daughter. I was the Anglo, the gringo. Rose's extended family also disapproved of her dating a white boy, telling her she'd stay, she should stay with her own kind. To be fair, they eventually accepted me and treated me with great kindness and affection. But Angelo's disapproval was more difficult. One winter day, Rose's father gave her an ultimatum. The next morning, I was coming home from my night shift at the box factory. As I got off the bus at 24th Street, Rose was waiting there for me. She had two bags containing her belongings, tears streaming down her face. We have been together ever since that day. Eventually, Rose and I got married and had children, and Angel came to accept us and became a wonderful grandfather to our children. I think one of the reasons Angel Angela warmed up to me was that I spoke Spanish to him. I began to learn Spanish in the factories and warehouses where I worked. Because Angelo was old enough to be my father, I always addressed him in Spanish using the formal forms of speech, such as usted, as a mark of respect. I did not address him as two until I knew him better. <clears throat> On one occasion, Angelo had surgery and spent a few weeks with us to recuperate. One day, we were quietly sitting together watching a Cubs baseball game and I've forgotten how we started talking about being in the military. I told him about some of my experiences as a medic in the Navy in the early 60s. Angelo also, in a quiet voice, began recalling how war had come to his hometown when he was still a teenager. Angelo was, was born during, in 1911 during the Mexican Revolution. One outcome of the revolution was the adoption of a new constitution with stringent restrictions on the activities of the Catholic Church. In 1926, when Angelo was 15 years old, civil war broke out in Mexico. This was the Cristero War, a conflict between the secular federal government and Catholic partisans. The government was determined to enforce provisions of the Constitution that restricted the Catholic Church's activities. 
the war was especially intense in Angelo's home state of Jalisco. Hundreds of priests and peasants were executed by the federales. To be sure, atrocities and war crimes were committed by both sides. It is estimated that about 90,000 people died. Postings on the internet show that bitter memories of the war remain today. When Angelo was still living at home, the federales swept through his town. It was their practice to force young men to join them using threats of death or destruction of their homes. He did tell me that he was forced to join the army, exactly how he didn't say, but I suspect it was under the threat of death because he did say he witnessed some summary executions. Angelo said they gave him a horse, a bandolero, and a rifle, and so he became a federale. And in a quiet voice, Angelo would at times tell me about the horrors and atrocities he witnessed. On one occasion, Angelo told me how his unit had approached a town in the state of Jalisco. There was a railroad track into town with a line of utility poles running parallel to it. Hanging from each pole, stretching into the distance, was the corpse of an executed Catholic. The bodies were left to hang as a warning to others who might resist the government. This image stayed in my mind for a long time, for years, but had faded over time. A few months ago, however, as I was researching the Cristero War, I found an article in Wikipedia on this topic. As I read it, I came across a black and white picture depicting this very scene almost exactly as Angelo had described it. In the photo, the railroad tracks recede into the distance and there's no mistaking the cruel image of corpses hanging from the utility poles. Along the bottom of the photo, someone has written in Spanish, Catholics executed in Jalisco. The sight of that photo hit me like a slap in the face. I realized the painful reality of the scene which Angelo had described to me so many years ago. And I could hear in his voice, uh, soft as a whisper with grief saying, oh, Jimmy, you don't know how it was. Angelo also told me he witnessed the execution of civilians. We may find it difficult to understand the impact of such experiences on a young man still in adolescence. As a grown man, Angelo was not bitter or angry. Rather, he showed deep compassion and generosity and love for his family. He also exemplified courage, honor, and respect, values central to a Mexican culture. And I believe it was this worldview which led him to disapprove of me as a suitor for his daughter in the early years. There's also the profound truth of 500 years of exploitation and oppression of indigenous peoples by Europeans that persist today all over the Americas. The Cristero War was just one tragic symptom of this oppression that happened to catch up a young boy in a bitter civil war. Sometime after the war, Angelo left his mother and beloved homeland to migrate to the United States. Here he worked all his life, paid taxes, and respected the laws of his community. Despite having lost his sight, he worked more than 30 years in a furniture factory on the south side of Chicago, and he lived many years in the 18th Street Barrio among his friends and relatives. He was a proud citizen of this country, a man to be respected and honored. Although Angelo faced many obstacles during his lifetime, in some ways he was not unique. Thousands of young men fled the violence and poverty in Mexico after the war. Nevertheless, Angelo Flores stands as an example, shining example of the contribution of these people in the country we call America, 
a true gentleman, un caballero verdadero. Thank you. The Latin Deli, an Ars Poetica by Judith Ortiz Kofer. Presiding over a formica counter, plastic mother and child magnetized to the top of an ancient register, the heady mix of smells from open bins of dried codfish, the green plantains hanging in stalks like votive offerings. She is the patroness of exiles, a woman of no age who was never pretty, who spends her days selling canned memories while listening to the Puerto Ricans complain that it would be cheaper to fly to San Juan than to buy a pound of Bustelo coffee here. And to Cubans, perfecting their speech of the glorious return to Havana, where no one has been allowed to die and nothing to change until then. To Mexicans who pass through, talking lyrically of dolores to be made in El Norte, all wanting the comfort of spoken Spanish to gaze upon the family portrait of her plain, wide face, her ample bosom resting on her plump arms, her look of maternal interest as they speak to her and each other of their dreams and their disillusions, how she smiles understanding when they walk down the narrow aisles of her store, reading the labels of packages aloud as if they were the names of lost lovers, suspiros, merengues, the stale candy of everyone's childhood. She spends her days slicing jamón y queso and wrapping it in wax paper tied with string, plain ham and cheese that would cost less at the A&P, but it would not satisfy the hunger of the fragile old man lost in the folds of his winter coat who brings her lists of items that he reads to her like poetry, or the others whose needs she must divine, conjuring up products from places that now exist only in their hearts, closed ports she must deal with. Cute Mexican Girl Syndrome by R.C., the self-described lifetime poet laureate of Paplote, Texas. The cute Mexican girl had legs of honey. Her tongue flipped arroz con pollo, her triangle scented with tortilla-like perfume. Her saliva coated my chest with her jalapeno breath. The Austin, Texas cops were prowling the streets, looking for minorities to kill. So I told her, let's just stay home and make love all night long, which is what we did. 
trying not to write one, a run-on sentence if we could help it, and afterwards, we smoked stolen cigarettes made from dried cilantro leaves, her hands like thunder once again, but this time La Llorona's children ganged up on her and killed her. That's when I woke up from the limerick, and the cute Mexican girl was telling me, you drank too much turquila with an R. And just then the phone rang like a pinata we bought for our two-year-old's birthday party. We heard the killer cops driving away to kill more blacks and Mexicans, which is their job, I guess. So who are we to criticize, says my white neighbor. M&M's by R.C. Anonymous. El Otro Patas loved his brown M&M girl. As the blue and the red M&M's fought over the turf that belonged to Mr. Mars and the green M&M's were green with envy of El Otro's girl, the yellow M&M's were scared to be jealous and the purple M&M's were just hateful. But El Ocho Patas and his brown M&M girl walked through the barrio smeared in chocolate. Black Lace Bra Kind of Woman by Sandra Cisneros. Watch a lay. She's a black lace bra kind of woman, the kind who serves up suicide with every kamikaze poured in the neon blue of evening. A tease and a twirl. I've seen that two-step girl in action. I've gambled bad odds and sat shotgun when she rambled her 59 Pontiac between the blurred lines dividing sense from senselessness. Ruin your clothes, she will. Get you home way after hours. Drive her 5975 on 35 like there is no tomorrow. Woman zydecoing into her own decade. 30 years pleaded behind her like the wail of a San Antonio accordion. And now the good times are coming. Girl, I tell you, the good times are here. You Bring Out the Mexican in Me by Sandra Cisneros. You bring out the Mexican in me, the hunkered, thick, dark spiral, the co co core, I'm sorry, of a heart howl, the bitter bile, the taquilla lacrimas on Saturday all through, all through next weekend Sunday. You are the one I'd let go for the, uh, I'd let go the other loves for. Surrender my one woman house, Allow you red wine in bed, even with my vintage lace linens. Maybe, maybe for you, you bring out the Dolores Del Rio in me, the Mexican Spitfire in me, the raw Navajas glint and passion in me, the raised cane and dance with the rooster-footed devil in me, the spangled sequin in me, the eagle and serpent in me, the mariachi trumpets of the blood in me, the Aztec love of war in me, the fierce obsidian of the tongue in me, the berenchuda bien cabrona in me, the Pandora's curiosity in me, the pre-Columbian death and destruction in me, the rainforest disaster 
nuclear threat in me, the fear of fascists in me. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You bring out the colonizer in me, the holocaust of desire in me, the Mexico City 85 earthquake in me, the Popocatapetl Itzachiwadl in me, the tidal wave of recession in the Augustine Lara hopeless romantic in me, the barbacoa taquitas on Sunday in me, they cover the mirrors with a cloth in me. Sweet twin, <clears throat> my wicked other, I am the memory that circles your bed nights and tugs you taut as moon tugs ocean. I claim you all mine, arrogant as manifest destiny. I want to rattle and rent you in two. I want to defile you and raise hell. I want to pull out the kitchen knives, dull and sharp, and whisk the air with crosses. Me sacas lo mexicana in me, like it or not, honey. You bring out the Ulad Nile in me, the stand back white witch in me the spit switchblade in the boot in me, the Acapulco cliff diver in me, the Flecha Roja mountain disaster in me, the dengue fever in me, the Alarma murderess in me. I could kill in the name of you and think it worth it. Brandish a fork and terrorize rivals, female and male who loiter and look at you languid in your light. Oh, I am evil. I am the filth goddess Tlatzol Teor. I am the swallower of sins, the lust goddess without guilt, the delicious debauchery. You bring out the primordial exquisiteness in me, the nasty obsession in me, the corporal and venial sin in me the original transgression in me. Red ochre, yellow ochre, indigo, cochineal, pignon, copal, sweet grass, myrrh, all you saints, blessed and terrible, Virgen de Guadalupe, Diosa, Coatlicue, I invoke you. Quiera ser tuya, only yours, only you. Quiero amarte, atarte, amararte. Love the way a Mexican woman loves. Let me show you. Love the only way I know how. Dollop of Sour Cream by Isabel Robles. While in Arizona, grandma tries to teach me how to master making tortillas. Everyone I make is awkward and confused, stuck between shapes and overdone in all the wrong places. It's okay, Mirahi, she says, you're not used to this. During roll call in Iowa, the substitutes furrowed brows, wide eyes on my last name, Thank God middle names aren't required. Nativist doesn't really roll off a rigid tongue. I'm Teresa with a dollop of sour cream. While dad perfects draws out, perfectly draws out his R's and Trerdo and laughs with the butcher, there I stand, arms intertwined behind my back, trying to catch the words from their rapid, joyful conversation I don't understand. During Spanish class, a girl and my teacher laugh. Oh, it's a Mexican thing, the girl says. You wouldn't get it. 
Does she not know in Arizona I'm surrounded by a mob of Robleses and I'm the only one that's not a Mexican thing? I'm chorizo with a dollop of sour cream. What the girl doesn't know is that I am as Mexican as her, even with my blonde hair, green eyes, and fair skin. Bet you 100 pesos, pesos my dad and I could whip up a mean pizzoli that would rival hers any day and win. What no one knows is that green chilies taste delicious in scrambled eggs with a pack of warm tortillas on the side, and there's nothing wrong with a little bit of sour cream in your chorizo, because I am chorizo with a dollop of sour cream. Let us gather in a flourishing way by Juan Felipe Herrera. Let us gather in a flourishing way with sunlight grains opening the songs that we bring each day in the young pasto our body to gift and to give gleaming pearls of corn flowing trees of life in the four corners. Let us gather in a flourishing way, content, filled with life force, giving birth to fragrant rivers, sweet, fresh meadows, turquoise, strong flesh of our children, rainbows. Let us gather in a flourishing way, in the light and the flesh of our heart, to toil happily in fields of blossoms, together to stretch our arms happily with the morning rain, early star on our foreheads, sky of warmth and wisdom to meet us wherever, where we forever toil, in the garden of our struggle and joy. Let us offer our hearts to greet our eagle rising freedom to celebrate linked arms, branches, stones, cacti, plumes, piercing, bursting figs and avocados, ripe butterfly fields and bright seas of our face, to breathe everything on the journey, blessing seeds to give, to grow maize in the hands of our love. That concludes our program. Thank you very much. We are, in reading a lot, especially grateful to Rose and to Jim for creating this program, for sharing their memories with us. But one other thing, because Pat Huff has been in reading a lot for 10 years, and she's moving away next month, and I want special appreciation for Pat for her beautiful reading. <laughs>